evening sir since we are talking at the school of planning and architecture my question is regarding the structure the geometry and aesthetics of the man made structures have a deep impact on my mind sort of an emotional impact is such impact a result of only the aesthetics and physics or is there a spiritual sense to this too because i have heard some spiritual gurus speak of consecrated spaces what do you mean by a consecrated space a uh, a space which is uh, regarded with some sort of energy or a haunted place you will not call a haunted place a consecrated place you you mean a place that uh, uh, that radiates sacredness Huh? and when you uh, reach that place you experience a certain divine feeling or something huh that's how usually uh, we talk of consecrated spaces hmm? yeah. the opposite of that would be a haunted house hmm? so when you reach that place you start feeling jittery or something wrong is going on all those things no you see most of that is obviously just your own conditioning just your own conditioning that's the reason why you have to be told in advance that a particular place is a consecrated place you have to be told in advance and you have to be told very very strongly so that your mind is fully conditioned that that particular place is a consecrated place hmm? and when you reach there then you find you are indeed experiencing divinity hmm? so i have a curious incident to narrate on this so this is from my corporate days and uh, my job as a consultant required that i would frequently travel so once i was staying in a in a hotel uh, in a suburban area close to a large automobile factory and uh, at uh, that point i was uh, a consultant to that factory so it's one of the largest uh, producers of tractors in the country at this moment so i was there and a uh, uh, few others were there staying in the same hotel it was actually a guest house so it was a, it was a bit of a remote area a little away from the city so the guest house in charge comes and says uh, sirs because you are staying there you must definitely visit that particular uh, group of uh, uh, temples hmm? it's just around 20 kilometers from here and uh, Uh, a lot of uh, folklore is attached to it and especially the the temple number 8 the temple number 8 hmm? there are a lot of uh, stories and uh, even miracles uh, attached to its name so we said fine he said uh, i mean that entire uh, group of little temples and those are pretty old temples not in proper shape either hmm? dilapidated and all and there was a mystique attached to them so he directed us specifically towards temple number 8 and all those temples were quite close by so you got down from the car and in front of you was this cluster of temples and we were told to go to temple number 
eight. So we 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 got down and uh, um, after a while, uh, one of uh, my fellows from the guest house, he comes and there is a peculiar glow on his face. Hmm? And he says, I really experienced divinity. Really experienced divinity. I was uh, standing at temple number 8 because that's the uh, place I had been directed to. I had been told that's the place where the magic is. So you go uh, right to that place. So I was standing there. And of course, because the temples were old and all, there were no markings. You could not know really which one is the temple number 8. You had to manually count. You knew that one was 1 and this is 8. And there were 12 or 14 little temples. So I was standing in front of temple number 8, trying hard to uh, experience divinity from there. And then this fellow comes to me and says, Miraculous. Hmm? Absolutely out of this world. Hmm? Temple number 8 for sure has some sacred vibes. What I have experienced just now is definitely a paranormal phenomena. So I said, okay, you did that, fine. And this fellow was a deeply religious fellow. All kinds of uh, rituals we knew he was partaking in and all those things. And he had a great belief in the metaphysical and the paranormal and such things. So he comes and says, I just spent around 10 to 15 minutes in temple number 8 and you cannot just cannot imagine what I have experienced so I said wow please please narrate me your experience but there is one little thing I want to tell you the temple you are coming from is temple number (laughs) 6 temple number 8 is where I am standing and the moment I said that all his experience vanished He said, oh, but then that must be a fluke. Do you understand this? You are already conditioned to experience so-called sacredness. You have been told that if you go to this place, there is sacredness. So that fellow enters temple number 6, thinking that it is temple number 8 and starts experiencing sacredness that he was supposed to experience at temple number 8. This thing applies obviously not only to temple but uh, structures from all religions. It would apply to mosques, churches, all other places. That's what. It's all within you. It's your own belief that you experience. There is nothing special in the structure as such. Hmm? Nothing in the structure that... uh, And if someone says, oh, you know, there is this temple and now I am consecrating it and now it becomes special, that fellow is out to fool you. As simple as that. If someone says the architecture is special, even that can be admitted to an extent. Because there can be beauty in stuff that is main mad. Just as there is beauty in physical nature, there is also beauty in man-made stuff. So that can be admitted. Yes, there are Uh, There are man-made paintings, there are man-made machines that are absolutely exquisite. Someone can write a fabulous software. The same uh, thing that was being accomplished by by, by a computer program that ran over 500 lines. Someone comes and finishes that off in 45 lines. It's a marvelous piece, a thing of beauty. I understand, there is beauty. There is beauty in the way you solve a problem in mathematics. There is beauty in the way you compose a poem or write an essay. And there can obviously be beauty in architecture as well. So if you say, because the thing is beautiful, I love it. I understand. When you you look at the mighty Himalayas, when you look at the snow-capped peaks, when you look at the Ganga gushing down, It definitely has 
uh, a soothing effect on the mind. That too I can understand. Hmm? But to say that a place can be consecrated through rituals or by a special man going and performing ceremonies is absolutely hogwash. Hmm? Uh, none of that. People say, no, look at the deity. The deity is stone till a certain point and then a priest comes and, and performs a few rituals and narrates a few uh, mantras and then the deity um, comes alive or gets, gets charged, gets energized, becomes real. All that is nonsense. None of that can happen. All that is just conditioning, conditioning and conditioning. That's why one man's sacred place is very ordinary for the other. Is it not? Hmm? Yeah. A Muslim passes in front of a mosque and the kind of experience that he gets is not the experience that a Jew would get passing in front of the same mosque or a Hindu would get passing in front of the same mosque. It's all very subjective. It's within you. It's not in that structure. Hmm? What can be in the structure is something else. There can be beauty in the structure. There can be sophistication in the structure. Also, there can be one more thing in the structure. Very important. I'm glad I didn't forget that. The structure can have great pointers towards higher values. And then the structure really um, becomes a, a, a living story. The structure then becomes a teacher. The structure is not teaching you something. Huh? Let's say there is something carved on the walls. Or let's say there is a painting. Or let's say there is a specific shape to the pillars. Now that can mean something. I definitely admit that and I respect that. But for that to mean anything, you must know what the meaning is. But do you know what the meaning is? If you do not know what the meaning is, how have you just blindly started uh, parroting sacred, sacred? Do you, do you get this? For example, think of the swan, the huns. Hmm? The huns. Now the, the huns is a very important motif in Vedant. Hmm? Why? Because it, it refers uh, to the Atma, the free bird, your fundamental inner nature hmm, of freedom. That's what the Hans refers to. Also, when you write uh, Hanso and you, and you uh, <coughs> uh, start chanting that, and so and so that turns into soham and soham means that am i huh? so that answers the fundamental vedantic uh, query who am i koham soham becomes the response to koham so if you look at a hans drawn on a wall hmm? or uh, etched or, or carved or something. And you are immediately reminded of the Atma, the pure self. Then there is sacredness. Definitely. But if you do not know what the bird stands for and you start saying, Oh, great peace, wonderful vibes. Then you are just fooling yourself. That bird, that shape was put there to remind you of something. If indeed you are reminded, then the shape has worked for you. But if you are not being reminded at all, and you are just saying, no, 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 I am getting vibes, then you are uh, hell-bent on remaining who you are. Then you don't want to benefit from the temple. Your ego is so strong that uh, it has defeated the temple. And you are just saying, oh, this is a consecrated space, so I am benefiting from being here. Nobody benefits from being anywhere unless the mind is active, unless the consciousness understands what is going on. Right now, you might be benefiting from this conversation because your mind 
is attentive and is trying to understand what is going on, right? Similarly, if you go to a temple, I'm saying temple because typically when you say consecrated space, you mean a temple. You can mean other places also, but typically a temple. When you go to the temple, you must know what everything stands for. And if you know that, then the temple will indeed have a beneficial effect on you. But if you do not know, what is the point? Similarly, the, the mantras, the verses, huh, the shlok. Do you know what that means? If you do not know, then uh, it is a thing of stupidity to just keep hearing. In fact, you will become dull if you keep hearing something you do not understand. Now, Sanskrit is a language most of us uh, do not understand. It's a beautiful language. More people should uh, know Sanskrit. But uh, in actuality, we do not know. And then you sit through hours and hours of ritual listening to Sanskrit verses. How will that help you? But you say, no, no, no. There is something special in the sound of the mantras. Those vibrations are reaching my ears. And even if I do not understand their meaning, they are still helping me. No, they are not helping you. Just as watching the Hans figure will not help you if you do not know what Hans stands for. Similarly, listening to a mantra will not help you if you do not know its meaning. Not only should you know its meaning, you should also know the, the deeper meaning. Hmm? You should also know what that ultimately points towards. And ultimately, if a mantra is worth the name, it should point towards self-knowledge because that is all that there is to spirituality. Spirituality is not about spirits. Spirituality is not bhut Pret business. Spirituality basically means Atmagyan, self-knowledge. In fact, spirituality is a word that I more and more now feel like dropping because it has become very misused. Spirituality now stands for so many obnoxious things. First of all, we destroyed the word religion. Now we have destroyed the word spirituality as well. Self-knowledge is still something we have not put our dirty hands on. So, the real thing is self-knowledge. Can you tell me how the shape of the temple is encouraging self-knowledge within you? If it is encouraging, then the temple is beneficial. Can you tell me how the sound of the mantra is... Uh, is uh, uh, removing your ignorance, clearing away your doubts, melting your ego, bringing clarity to you. If it is not bringing clarity to you, just that there is a lot of music and uh, visual extravaganza and that is uh, making you feel great, then you are being drugged in that place. A lot of temples a lot of hyped temples, these things uh, are now happening. Not only in temples, in other places also. I must mention churches, I must mention synagogues. It's happening everywhere. Hmm? They have become places of entertainment. A lot of song, dance, optics, great sounds. Hmm? So, all that is just food for the ego. The ego is becoming stronger by visiting such places. And to top it, the ego gets the license to say, I just came from some sacred place, a consecrated place where I got truly holy vibes. You didn't get any holy vibes. You just got fattened. You were an ordinary ego before you went to that place. Now you are a totally ignorant, drunk and arrogant ego hmm? that calls itself religious. So, so that's, a, that's a great problem. Um, there are several temples that have shlokas from the Upanishads carved on them. It's beautiful. Hmm? When you visit Varanasi, go to the uh, temple inside BHU. For hours, Whenever I have uh, visited BHU, I have found myself sitting there. And uh, I was very young. I think my board results had just been declared class 10th. Because my father came from Varanasi. So I went there with him and 
it was enthralling. Hmm? All the chosen verses from the Upanishads were there in the temple. Now that's what a temple really is. And I made notes. And I made lots of notes. And for a very long time, I suppose a few decades, those little pieces of paper, they remained in my wallet. I just sat down and started copying from the walls. <laughs> Think copying from the walls. Hmm? Now that's a temple. And if I remember correctly, there were verses from, from Buddhist scriptures, also from Jain scriptures. Spirituality is not mumbo-jumbo. Spirituality is hard, unrelenting inquiry. You want to know what is going on. Spirituality is philosophy with the purpose of liberation from the ordeal of life. That's what philosophy is. Philosophy is, um, spirituality is not a belief system. Come on, start believing in this. Come on, start just dancing or parroting something totally mindlessly. You must ask, what do the arms of the deity stand for? And if the figure is worth it, there would definitely be a meaning. Figure out the meaning. And if there is no meaning, then there is no compulsion to again and again visit that place. Everything is symbolic. And the right meaning has to be ascertained. You must know what is being pointed at. And if the temple is real, then it will definitely point only towards the sky, the truth, the absolute freedom. And if you cannot see that, then you must say, oh, the temple right now holds no meaning for me. Because that temple is not telling me of liberation. Not the temple's fault really, my own fault. I cannot read the meaning. Your emphasis should be on reading the meaning. That's what you must try for. What is hidden here? What is the meaning? If th there is a meaning, I should know. And unfortunately, there is some probability that some temples may not have any meaning. Because there are lakhs of temples, you see. But all the great ones, all the real ones, definitely point towards the absolute. And you must know how that pointer is working. The functioning of that pointer must be known with great application of intellect and logic. Do not keep your mind, your, your logic, your argument, your intellect aside when you enter a place of religion. Religion requires great application of intellect and logic. And it is this uh, intellectless, thoughtless, mindless religiosity that has brought us down to our sorry state. It is not without reason that India suffered so badly for so many centuries. To me, the primary reason was misinterpretation and exploitation of religion. And that is still continuing. Also in the last 10-20 years, that exploitation has somehow worsened. We thought that with the <clears throat> arrival of science and education, Hmm? And, and values of freedom and inquiry. Superstition would reduce. The masses would refuse to be fooled. But uh, very strangely, uh, that has not come to pass. What we are seeing is a phenomena in the opposite direction. More and more blind kinds of cults are rising. People are not reading. People are becoming more and more ignorant 
of their own central scriptures. And you have religious leaders who repeatedly say that there is no need to read. In, in fact, in, in, in some cults I have heard, reading is prohibited. They say, no, you don't read anything. Especially don't read anything related to science. You just read these three, four books that our cult prescribes and become totally brainwashed. This is very unfortunate and very scary. I do not know what we are making of this nation. There can be no religiosity without sound and sharp application of the mind. Huh? Don't keep your mind aside when you enter the scope and dimension of religion. Ask, seek to understand. And if you are told to believe in something blindly, just refuse. No, that's not what religion is about. Religion is the opposite of blind, blind belief. But as we said, religion, the word has been corrupted. So let's simply say self-knowledge is the opposite of blind belief. Let them usurp the word religion. Hmm? They have taken it away. Let's give it to them. Let's stick to self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is inquiry. You want to know. You want to understand what is going on. And create great structures with great sophistication. As a uh, student, as a practitioner of architecture, create buildings that do not have just utilitarian value, but that point towards something higher, that give life with a sense of purpose. When you look at that building, you realize the building is saying something to you very purposefully and saying something very important. And if you can understand what the building is saying, then you will be a better person. That's the kind of structure you should try to create. In that creation lies consecration. Consecration does not lie in standing in front of the building and narrating a few mantras and sprinkling water and using some rice and, and sandalwood and doing a few things and then you say, oh, now it is consecrated. Now the deity uh, is uh, active and energized. And you, No, no, no. Create a great building that speaks really. Hmm? Let there be great pointers. Refer to great pieces from world literature, including religious literature. And have pointers that remind you of what happened in that particular story or that particular novel or that particular poem or in that particular Upanishad. That's when the building will stand as something that elevates you. Huh? You look at the building and you say, well, life is worth living. Life is worth living. This building speaks. Huh? It is not there just to house a few people. It is not an animal's cave. It is not an insect's rock. It is a, it is a living structure. Huh? So, if you can create uh, such a thing, you would come very close to creating a temple. And believe me, no, don't believe me. <laughs> You're not supposed to believe anything. Hmm? So, I would ever that that's how the first temple would have been built. Hmm? You want to have a place where your ego can just bow down. Hmm? You, you want to have something of beauty. You want to have something that is higher than yourself. And that's how man would have built his first temple. He said, fine, life is just ordinary mediocre. But uh, that does not satisfy me. Let there be something higher than this everyday living, than this usual muck. And then you say, let there be a temple. Let there be a temple. The temple stands for everything that is worth worshipping. What is worth worshipping? What is something that you value highly? Tell me, please. I would hear it from you. What is worth worshipping? Can we unmute the student? Can she have unmuted yourself? You can see. 
mm, something that provides uh, something that improves your consciousness to a great level yeah but what is it that you'd value in life don't go by the prescription huh tell me very originally very honestly as a person what is it that you value in life can't hear you i didn't didn't get it um existence of my own being existence of my own being simplify that for somebody as ignorant as me i exist yes that is right so you mean life but what is it that you value in life what is it that you find uh, worth respecting in life or in a person let's say knowledge of that person knowledge and think of the people you respect huh and please tell me what is it in them that is worth respecting mm, their freedom their independence okay. freedom and you said knowledge and you said independence and courage maybe courage courage so can you create a structure that's a testament to courage and by knowledge you would mean understanding can you can you have a building that encourages you to understand devoted to both understanding if you can create such a building that's a de facto temple that's a real temple let not uh, religion have a monopoly over temples if you can create a building that encourages you to be courageous that building is a temple and that's how the first temples would have been made courage is the dt knowledge is the dt so when you when you visit the, that place you say well 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 all my life on one side all the places that i usually visit on one side and this place on one side and this place is just somehow more lovely i come here and i am reminded of something very superior very elevated very sublime i come here and it's like coming to a senior to a guide to a well wisher to a beloved who who tells me daughter don't get lost in the in the humdrum affairs of life remember what is truly important knowledge is important courage is important freedom is important that's what consecration is so consecration is not a ritual consecration is when you are reminded of that which is truly sacred and the name of that is freedom yeah. great <clears throat> so my follow up question is that you mentioned that all the objects like say in a temple or anywhere you go is they are like pointers right to the higher truth so, so in this case shouldn't we do a little more inquiry with our relation to everything around us like all the objects that we're surrounded by because why do we just limit ourselves to scriptures or temple something that's been given to us why can't Wonderful. we assign our own meaning Beautiful. to things like you know maybe lovely lovely Love you. Think of the think of the person 
who raised the first temple. He had no precedent to go by, right? In some sense, he created his personal temple, his or her personal temple. Because there was no tradition he was following. He said, obviously, life is not worth living if there is no sacredness in it. If there is no sacredness, then life is dull, boring, monotonous, uh, just a mass of mediocrity. I don't want to live that way. There has to be something higher. So that was a personal aspiration that took the shape of a temple. And that can happen even today, obviously. You can have your personal sacred space. You must have that. And, you know, those who have known, they have said, now we have no need of sacred spaces because we are in so deep love with sacredness that we cannot live without sacredness at any point, at any place. So there is no need for especially made sacred spots. The kind of inquiry that we live in now, the, the purity of mind that we live with now, renders the entire universe sacred for us. The entire universe is now an open book of truth to us. So there is no need for us even to visit a temple or any other place. But that's obviously a very advanced stage, one of the... Uh, higher and uh, final stages. So let's not talk of that. But you are very right that uh, sacredness is, uh, is something obviously for us. So it is something very intimate, very personal. So you can have your little, little personal shrine, definitely. And if you can have that, then uh, you are entering true religiosity. It is okay to, you said that it's for higher levels, right? So when you're initially maybe starting out, like it is okay to go to these places because the environment is a little more conducive for that type of work that you want you to mean do. These, by these places, you mean the commonly accepted temples? Places that claim to be, uh, you know. Many of them, many of them are very beautifully built and uh, very purposefully designed. It's just that we are such stupid people that we have destroyed those places. Those were works of masterminds, people who could think, probe, inquire, understand. And the ones who are visiting those places now are all just dumb, blind followers who do not understand a thing. They come there just very ritualistically, very blindly in no knowledge of what that place stands for. Right? So, <clears throat> there are a few temples I have a special relationship with. And it breaks my heart to visit them when there is a crowd. It's it becomes a bit like an intimate love affair. You don't want to share it with a crowd. Especially if the crowd is insensitive, violent, ignorant and disrespectful to the sacredness of that place. So I found myself <laughs> gazing at my, my, my beloved temples from a distance, especially in the night. So, uh, yes, uh, it's not just uh, all right to visit uh, uh, great places of worship. Uh, it is also beneficial. But then you must understand what's going on. Just going to the Ganga and taking a few dips is not going to help. That's not helping. Uh, <coughs> People visit Kedarnath, they exploit the, the mules, the donkeys there and they go and then they do all kinds of stupidities and they return, that's not going to help. So when you go to a, a sacred place, meet that place with, uh, with your own sacredness. Don't let it be a dead ritual. Right? And 
uh, stick to the thing that you first talked of, creating your personal shrine. Nobody can monopolize the truth. And the truth never said that it is going to be based only at a particular geographical location. Hmm? Truth is your own personal reality, hmm? which when approached becomes totally impersonal. Hmm? But for you to begin with, you must say it is my own thing. It is the thing within. So it is good to visit uh, religious places, um, places of pilgrimage and all those things. It's all right. Uh, but also, uh, you must constantly be in touch with your own core. You must constantly be assessing the quality of your own mind. Is there anger? Is there greed? Is there a lot of fear? Is there blind faith? Is there ignorance? You must keep asking these questions. That's true religiosity. That's beautiful. Thank you, sir.